Hello, my name is Karen Smith. I'm a Labour Member of Parliament here in Westminster and I'm delighted to chair this um, session this morning uh, on um, choice at the end of life. And we've got some excellent speakers. It is our first virtual, what we call an all party group on choice at the end of life. Um, we have um, colleagues muted. We have some speakers. Um, which will take us about half an hour or so, and then we will be open to questions. It's the first time we've done this, so we're hoping it goes well. And um, do forgive us if there are any technical hitches, but very much looking forward to hearing our speakers and hearing some other contributions. Before we go, we are an official uh, body of parliament. We do have some a little bit of business to attend to, and I'm delighted to be able to nominate one of my fellow parliamentarians, Andrew Mitchell, as co-chair of the APPG, and I'd like to ask Baroness Meacher to second that nomination. Yes, I happily second that nomination of Andrew Mitchell. Andrew, would you like to say a few words as to if you're happy to accept that nomination and, and, and join myself as co-chair on this group? Yes, thank you very much, Karen. I, I should just explain that, um, that we're doing a sort of double act here. Um, so uh, I will turn the, the I will for most of the meeting I will turn the screen uh, to face you. Yeah. Um, but uh, thank you very much, Steve. I accept the nomination with uh, great pleasure. Um, I've changed my mind over the thirty years I've been in the House of Commons on this issue. Um, uh, uh, when I arrived in the House of Commons as a as a, a callow youth, I was very much opposed to to it in all its forms, um, but I have, uh, as I've come across um, constituents who have been facing these extremely difficult uh, issues, uh, members of my own family too, and I have completely changed my mind. Not least it's because I would want uh, the, uh, this change in the law for myself or for members of my own family. And I think that uh, the clear evidence from our constituents is that parliamentary opinion is lagging well behind opinion in the country. I think that evidence from overseas is clear that it is possible to get rid of uh, uh, almost all, if not all, the fears that people have about this legislation. And so I'm delighted to uh, work with uh, Karen to try and make sure that we move parliamentary opinion over a period of time into a, a, a better place. Uh, just a final point I should very quickly make is I don't think it's sensible to have uh, another bill at this point, to have a crack at that parliamentary opinion hasn't moved enough, but it is moving. And uh, hopefully before the end of this parliament, maybe we will be able to contemplate legislation. But I think uh, for now, we need to find other mechanisms, including inquiries, including parliamentary inquiries, to try and move the dial on all of this. Thank so thank you. you very much for your nomination. I'm very happy to serve. Delighted. And I don't think there are any objections to that. That's a formal process. So delighted to um, uh, approve that um, and look forward to working with you on that. And I think that's a, a good introduction for people who perhaps don't understand um, or are frustrated by the lack of parliamentary process. Um, I'm not someone who changed my mind. I came in to change this law um, from my own experiences. And during this pandemic, I think thousands of families have experienced a different sort of heartbreak with death. Um, my own father-in-law passed away during this time with COVID. Um, unable for us to hug and talk and um, grieve in the normal way that people do. Um, and I think that's heightened the lack of choice and control that people have um, normally in, in, our, in our country right now. This pandemic has made people think differently about death and dying and the importance of choice and the importance of um, being with, with one's family through those really terrible times. Um, we've, got, um, we've got Sarah coming up next and I just, this book um, um, that Sarah's co-authored is just a magnificent summary of where we've been and where we need to go. Um, and it's really, really timely. And I know a lot of people on this call will be going through some very difficult times um, themselves at the moment. So we're, we've, we're very much looking forward to hearing from our speakers and making progress here in, here in this country. So first up, I'd like to welcome Sarah Wooten uh, to talk about last rights and the case for and changing the context around assisted dying. And I'll just say that Sarah and Andrew are in the same room, they are socially distanced and switching the camera between them. So Sarah, over to you. Thank you, Karen. 
There's never been a better time for ambitious reform of how we die in the UK. COVID has reignited the debate on choice at the end of life. It's made us all confront our own mortality and it's woken us up to what terminally ill people face on a daily basis, a sense of powerlessness, a lack of control, fear and anxiety over an uncertain future. Death and dying is everybody's business now. We have all been shocked at how some people have died from COVID. They've been isolated from their families, sometimes doctors making life and death decisions for them, not with them. And families not even able to have a proper funeral on occasion to celebrate loved ones' lives. But that's the way people died before the pandemic. Ask yourself, if you're shocked now, why were you complacent before? Let's be clear. First, breaking the nearly 60 year old blanket ban on assisted dying is a serious crime. It's punishable by up to 14 years in prison. Second, some people's suffering at the end of life is beyond the reach of even the best hospice and palliative care. Even implacable opponents of law change say that most people have good deaths. Imagine what the others have gone through. Last Rites tells their stories. The dying daughter who kept waking, confused and in pain from what was intended to be her last sleep in a hospice. She had to say goodbye to her mum seven times over five days. The son who had to see his mother scream out in agony from complications of thyroid cancer, he said her suffering will haunt him until the end of his life. I'd like you to reflect, what would you want for yourself and for your loved ones? Because of the blanket ban, people are taking the law into their own hands. One person a week goes to, the Switzerland, goes to Switzerland from the UK, as long as they can travel early enough and as long as they can afford 10,000 pounds. Most people can't. But even if you can, your family could be criminalized like Anne Whaley was, and there could be no funeral afterwards. Some dying people end their lives here, in Last Rites, Paul Blomfield MP tells us how his dad, with end-stage lung cancer, had a lonely death in his garage because he didn't want to implicate his family. Michael Rosen was a pioneering doctor in pain management. He was terminally ill and he wanted to die on his own terms. So, in the absence of an assisted dying law, he decided to starve and dehydrate himself to death. Yes, that, that is a lawful choice, if you can call it choice. His daughter told us that she found him walking up and down corridors because he wanted to burn more calories to accelerate the process. How can people say that that's okay, but assisted dying isn't? The major flaw in our 60 year old law is that it encourages people into these actions without any real protections or safeguards, but at the same time, denying people choice and control when they need it most, something we all treasure and value. Other parliaments have shown that it's possible to ditch, ditch divisiveness and scaremongering in favor of a mature and constructive conversation about how to craft a safeguarded law. Since the Commons vote in 2015, Canada, Australia and New Zealand have all passed assisted dying legislation, as well as six more states in the US. 150 million people worldwide now have access to this law. Since the Commons vote, the Royal College of Physicians has dropped its opposition to law change. and They were followed by the Faculty of Clinical Oncology, the home of cancer specialists. Opposition amongst GPs has crumbled in the last five years and the BMA has polled its membership and will be releasing those results soon, we hope. Since the Commons vote, half of police and crime commissioners have written to the Secretary of State Justice to say that they don't think the law is working. It's not working for dying people, for their families or indeed for police officers. They said it's causing significant distress, it's failing to protect people and it's ultimately a waste of their resources. We argue that the fault lines in society are caused by a hard line minority holding on to the old ideas that they're determined to force on everybody else. Choice at the end of life is no different from other liberal reforms and it will have the same historic legacy for any parliament that chooses to act. 
over 80% of the public support dying people having this choice. That's consistent across age, across social class, and across political allegiance. This is law reform that unites the country. It's now up to Parliament to seize the opportunity. We need a parliamentary inquiry into choice at the end of life. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And, and that was excellent. And it really is an excellent and very moving uh, book. Um, I'd like to um, now move over to Cher Safran um, in Oregon, um, where I believe it's about uh, one o'clock in the morning. I'm delighted um, you're able to join us. And that's the power of, of Zoom that we're able to come together across the world on our, our shared endeavor. So Cher, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for this opportunity to share my parents' experience with assisted dying. So in 2017, the year my parents turned 88 years old, each one of them was diagnosed terminally ill and each was given six months or fewer to live. My dad, Charlie, was failing from advanced Parkinson's and prostate cancer and mom, Francie, was declining from advanced coronary disease, heart attacks, and small strokes. They lived in Oregon State, which interestingly, 20 years before had passed the death with dignity law, allowing for assisted dying. And once each of my parents completed the very rigorous process of approval to be accepted to use the death with dignity law, they let us know as a family that that was what they were choosing. Their choice was not a surprise to us. They had been outspoken supporters of uh, assisted dying from as far back as I can remember. During my childhood, we all moved to India where my parents served as medical missionaries. My dad practicing as a physician in, in ear, nose and throat and teaching the doctors there in that specialty. And my mom was the hospital public relations manager. And India has a very open way of experiencing, honoring, and grieving death. And I do believe that that opened up our family's ability to talk about death. And it continued, especially my dad being a physician, death was very much a part of the conversation, even around the table. We saw death at its worst, and we also saw death at its best. And my parents always believed that there should be the choice of peaceful dying whenever possible. And I shared that belief. And for three years of my career as an ordained minister, I served as an interfaith chaplain for hospice in California. I always felt so honored to be with people at that sacred time of passing. And many of the patients died peacefully thanks to the tender care of hospice and their medication. But there were those who could not be relieved of their pain. And there were those who lingered day after day, after week, after month, unwillingly. But California had not passed the death with dignity law then, and so there was nothing we could do. It was an enormous relief to us, our family, to know that my parents had the option of passing peacefully. And the week before they died, they had arranged for all of us in the family, their daughters and our families, to come together and celebrate their life and to celebrate their 66 years of marriage. My husband Rob and I are videographers and so we casually filmed that day of celebration which include a lot of laughter, memory sharing, and tears. My, our children said goodbye to their grandparents and we girls and our husbands stayed for the rest of the week. During that week my husband and I captured on our cell phone videos snippets of conversations and moments with our parents and our intention was to simply share all of this with the family. But I had a friend who was also a hospice interfaith chaplain here in Seattle, and she said, Cher, please ask your parents if they will share their story with the public, because I really think it could make a difference. So I asked them if they would be willing, and they readily agreed 
they are so supportive of having this option available to everyone and they hope that their story would make a difference. On April 20th, 2017, um, our immediate family, my sisters and husbands gathered in my parents' apartment on their final day and two volunteers from the nonprofit group called End of Life Choices in Oregon they came to help prepare the medication for us so that we as a family could simply be together and share those precious moments. At 10 a.m. that morning, mom and dad each drank their medicine and then they lay down together on their bed as they had done nearly every night for 66 years. And they held hands and closed their eyes and they fell asleep. My sister and I sat in the room in silence with them and holding hands, my mom passed very peacefully in 15 minutes and my dad passed very peacefully 45 minutes later. And honestly, their death reflected so beautifully the integrity and grace of their lives. I miss my parents very much. They were going to die anyway. And it's such a relief to know that they could die peacefully. We were able to put together a short documentary about their story that we called Living and Dying, A Love Story. And the film is available for free for the public and has been seen around the world by I think now more than 80,000 people. My parents would feel so honored to know that their story has touched the hearts of so many and has helped to open the dialogue around this important and I'd say vital option of compassionate assistance in dying. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share their story with you today. Share, thank you so much for sharing that again with us. It's always painful and I just have such a beautiful image of that celebration and um, and you've done a marvelous, fantastic job for them and, and sharing with us. Thank you so much. Um, back in the UK, Joy, that's hard to listen to, I know. Um, um, I'm very grateful for you joining us today. If you can unmute and if you're able to share with us your, your story. Thank you, Joy. Hi, thanks everybody. Um, share, that was just so emotional for me. That would be exactly how we would have wanted it for our parents um, but that wasn't to be because every conversation um, that we had had to be taboo behind closed doors. Um, Dad wanted me to look into Dignitas for him and my husband advised me don't even look on your computer because you could be up for prosecution if you do that. So every conversation, because once dad got diagnosed with cancer, bowel cancer, he again was given six months to a year um, to live. Um, and he decided right from the beginning that he didn't want to have any treatment. He didn't want to go into a hospice. He wanted to die at home. And the conversation that he had with my brother on the way home from the hospital, was that he wanted to take his own life. Um, well, as soon as mom found out about this, they'd been together 60 years. They were married from when she was 19. That was the love of her life. So she wanted to go with him. Um, at first, I was very angry with my mom because she wasn't dying and I couldn't understand why she would want to go with my dad. And I, you know, I thought maybe there was all different factors in there. So I went down and spoke to her um, and she just held my hands and said to me, Joy, I love you. I love you with all my heart, but I want to be with your dad. And she couldn't have helped my dad to have obviously died without, without getting charged for murder herself. So she gave the ultimate sacrifice and that was her own life. Um, and so obviously they, on that dreadful morning where you had it, where it was beautifully and you had it filmed and that's what we would have wanted, um, you know, a wall smash being in the background and I was all loving and telling him, you know, how much we loved him and been able to say goodbye. My mum woke up to what she described as um, a wounded animal howling 
and she found my dad on the floor um, and when she got into him um, obviously by this time he was wearing adult nappies and when she got into him he'd messed himself and his dressing gown was open and she found this huge growth that was protruding from the nappies as well so she was 80 he was 82 and she literally got on her hands and knees and he had to hold on to her back and then obviously they had to crawl into the bathroom um she managed to clean him up and then get him back out and then when she got into the chair he'd messed himself again um and then he started to cry and begged her that please don't call the ambulance don't put me in hospital and he'd been wanting to go for a long long time but she'd uh like sort of you know because it was a really really hard decision for her to have to take her own life as well and so it was like not yet Dennis it's Christmas and then we got birthdays and it was my daughter's 21st birthday so there was always a reason not to but that morning when she saw the growth and obviously the suffering that dad was in that was the final um you know deciding factor for her and she she then agreed she said okay Dennis you know we'll do it and he just kissed her hand and said will you make this will you and she said yeah but you're gonna have to tell me what to do so obviously he'd been stockpiling um sleeping tablets which we didn't know about he told my mum what to do so obviously they both then took the tablets they got found um, by a family member rushed into hospital and they'd both been given the antidote. Uh, so when they both got to hospital, they were both at a level five. There was a level one when the paramedics found them and then they were at a level five. Um, and we chose not to have the DNR, which is obviously the do not resuscitate lift off dad, um, but mom hadn't got one on her. So obviously mom came through, dad, um, and he did then die peacefully in hospital um, with us around him but he was unconscious so we never had a chance to say goodbye to him we never had a chance to tell him what a wonderful father he was and how much we loved him we didn't get any any chance of that at all we have to believe that he heard us we have to you know think to ourselves that he was there and he heard everything that we said to him but we will never know we didn't get that chance so dad passed away peacefully on the Tuesday. I then went to the hospital on the Wednesday to uh, pick mum up because she'd been discharged. And then I got met with two nurses and a doctor telling me that there'd been a development that my mum had admitted to murdering my dad. And I couldn't comprehend this because as a family, we'd already been talking about this for months and months and months. Um, and the police came. I asked if she was going to get arrested for assisted suicide and they told me no, quite clearly she was getting arrested for murder. She's four foot ten, she was in a nighty dressing gown and slippers and they took her away and she was away in a cell for 30 hours. Um, then we had 18 months of not knowing whether after losing my dad to cancer, I was then going to lose my mum to prison. Um, so she got charged with murder on April the 1st um, and the court case was in um, September and then luckily for us the jury could see what had actually happened and they found her not guilty but all of this wouldn't have happened if the law was different we wouldn't have been cloak and dagger we wouldn't have been scared to have spoken to anybody we had no one to turn to no one to advise us no one to help us literally everything we did my mum and dad were very uh, careful in implicating any of us in any of this because of obviously of what they knew what would happen to us if, if um any of us was implicated so it was all very very um stressful and and when I hear your story, uh, it's that to me was just so emotional because that was just what I believe that should happen in this country and we should have that choice. So thank you. Joy, thank you. And again, the love of your family really shines through of how you wanted to support and 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 their loving relationship as well um, and that's really hard thank you thank you for sharing that very different experience of of 
of your, your parents here, here in, in Britain. Um, I'm now going to move over to Australia. Before I do, can I just remind people um, who are listening, and we've got hundreds of people uh, listening to this live, um, that there is a QA and a um, function. If people want to ask questions, we should have some time towards the end of the hour for some questions. So if you can indicate that on the chat function, um, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Um, now, I'd like to move to another parliamentarian um, in Australia. Again, the joys of Zoom, where I believe it's the evening. So you've had your, your day. Thank you for joining us at the end of your day, Jill. And Jill, you're going to give us the perspective from, from Victoria in Australia, if you can unmute yourself, and very delighted you can join us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Karen, and I'm um, delighted to join and um, um, to share and to joy. Thank you for sharing um, your stories, and I, I'd like to reflect upon um, the power of personal stories in driving political change. Um, but in Victoria, we have had assisted dying legalised, um, and those laws have been in effect now for just over 12 months and they've been used safely, they've been used compassionately, and all of the risks and the reasons that people often use as objections to taking the law and making sure that it meets community aspiration and that it's fair and compassionate, um, none of those fears, none of the fear mongering that we've seen during some of the debates around assisted dying have been realized. The history in Victoria was really, I think, seated in the power of a parliamentary committee um, that had people of um, different political persuasions um, who considered uh, this issue of how to drive um, assisted dying law reform um, in Victoria. And that was a committee um, that ended up having, I think, some recommendations um, in the majority for um, assisted dying law reform and some who were opposed that were in the minority on that report. I was the Minister for Health at the time. I have um, always um, believed in assisted dying for a range of reasons, but I grew up as the daughter of someone who had multiple sclerosis, um, who would have wished for a death in the way that you described, sure. Um, and we essentially, I think, had a great opportunity presented to us by having people of different political persuasions um, genuinely um, supportive of um, taking the risks around opening this up as a mainstream political issue. And it is my very strong view that assisted dying is a mainstream political issue. Um, after a parliamentary committee made a report, there were two things that could have happened. And I want to acknowledge one of the very important people um, that's on this call, and that's Fiona Patton, who um, was on the Parliamentary Committee. Uh, but there are two things that could have happened. There could have been a private member's bill, and they have been unsuccessful in driving that change in our state. And at that time, I um, sought support um, and was supported by the leader of our government um, to develop an assisted dying model that was a government bill. And why I think that that was important, even though there was a conscience vote, there was no binding um, party caucus. Um, um, I'm, you know, was, I'm from the Labor Party in um, Australia. Uh, but why I think that was important is it enabled us to use the resources of government to also help develop the model. And so the parliamentary committee had made some recommendations and, and there is always compromise. Um, when you have to drive to get political consensus. And we took those recommendations and we established um, a panel of very, very eminent people from um, great neurologists to the leaders of palliative care um, to um, medico legal experts who helped very judiciously work through how we would draft the law and draft the clinical practice and respond to many of these issues that um, people raise in objection. Some of those issues um, go to how do we ensure that this is not the subject of exploitation? How do we ensure that it's not used for the um, purposes of rationing healthcare? Um, and ultimately, and this was part of, I think, driving um, the bill successfully through both houses of parliament, we had to be able to um, um, obtain a majority of votes. And the only way we could do that was by dealing with those issues, but also 
fighting the war on fact in this debate, I think is so, so essential because there are those that are open-minded and support and, and, and in fact, many people um, would say that our model is too conservative. Um, there are those that for um, a variety of um, personal values or religious reasons, we, you, we will never persuade on this issue. But there is also that cohort of people that are very, very open-minded, that are moved by the power of personal stories, but need to be persuaded around the issues of exploitation, um, checks and balances that are in place, how to ensure that it's not misused and abused. And this is all about a topic that people find it so confronting to talk about. Um, so much effort and political capital is invested in pregnancy and the start of life. Um, but the end of life is seen as a politically taboo topic. Um, and one of the power, I think, of the processes that we used was that we were able to, through the use of these experts with political consensus, work through each of these issues as we developed our model for assisted dying. In terms of obtaining a majority in both houses of parliament to get this reform, and we were the first in Australia uh, to get this successfully voted up. I think there are a couple of really important things about the nature of the debate. And the first is, we should never let our political leaders off or get away with saying that the status quo is acceptable. When people are engaged in a debate about the reasons not to embrace law reform, you must squarely, I think, around those that are legislators and policy makers, um, engage them in why the status quo is not acceptable. And an important part of our debate in Australia was evidence from the coroner about these tragic stories, evidence from our judiciary who um, were having to preside um, and prosecutors who were having to look at these cases that they didn't want to prosecute, evidence from nurses who were working in an unregulated area under the secrecy of the privilege, perhaps, getting terminal sedation, um, but other people um, who don't have, didn't have access to those opportunities, having to take either the legal risk or die lonely, lonely private deaths, um, using things like the experiences of paramedics and police officers who had to go to the houses of distressed families um, where a person who, when given no other legal choice, made a choice of their own. And it's not acceptable and it's not a good enough reason um, to, to ignore the power and possibility of law reform in this area without having to say that you think the status quo is okay. And if there's any advice that I would give is in making the case for a safe, secure, compassionate model around assisted dying, the corollary of that needs to also be made um, very, very prominent, and that is the inhumanity of the status quo. And we've constantly got to be saying, why is it that irrespective of a person's political orientation, that we have mainstream political support for this reform, but we often don't see the courage and the tenacity from policy makers to actually drive the reform? Um, we had a saying in Australia, and it was a point that Andrew Denton, who established Go Gentle, which is one of the leading advocacy groups here, that there is a reason that term people that are dying are not marching in the streets demanding that Parliament change the law, and it's because they can't. We've got to continue to make this a mainstream political issue. We've got to continue to highlight the complete unacceptability of the status quo but at the same time, making sure that we are genuinely um, building models of assisted dying that are safe, um, that have the backing of expertise uh, and, and demonstrate um, when you look to places like Seattle and um, the states in the United, the places in the United States where it's been lawful, uh, to demonstrate that exploitation is low. And I remember going off um, to Portland um, and to Seattle um, as we were developing our laws. And what the overwhelming message to me is, we can't understand what the big deal is here. Um, and, and I suppose um, my, my 
my assurance to those of you that have invested so much time and energy in trying to drive this law reform is whilst this was the political crescendo and definitely the most important thing that I think that I've ever done as a politician, um, it was such a big political issue at the time. Um, it's been in place for a year now. Um, whilst, you know, some of the initial cases were the subject of some media commentary, there is a very strong sentiment that people are just getting on with it um, and, and the sky hasn't fallen in. And in fact, I'm, you know, the great highlights of my day are when getting letters from people who have been with their family, where their choice has been exercised, where the end of their life has been achieved with dignity um, and uh, 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 more power to your arm as um, you work through a model that is both safe, but one that you can perhaps obtain the, po the relevant political support to make it a reality. Um, it's gonna be one of those issues um, that generations come back and go, you know, uh, uh, we can't what believe so it's unlawful. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so yeah. good luck, and it's been a great delight to have the opportunity to share the Victorian experience with you. We're, Jill, thank you so much. We're so grateful, and there are a lot of parliamentarians on this call, many of my colleagues who are are, are wanting to ex learn that experience. And I mean, you said two really inter just many interesting things, but that this is a mainstream political view and it's also politically taboo. Um, uh, and, and I think that's uh, one of the issues that, that parts of parliamentarians are, are grappling with, but the experience of how you've done, it's very helpful. I know we're going to continue to work with you and other colleagues around the world to learn how to make safe laws. Thank you for your time. Um, and uh, that's a very timely then. And, and as you said also, this is an issue that crosses all political parties. It's not a party political um, uh, issue. It crosses all, all or political philosophies. Um, and uh, I'm delighted now to welcome back in England, uh, Lord Finkelstein from the Lords on assisted dying and overdue reform. Well, thank you so much. And it was uh, a privilege to be able to hear those stories, uh, to uh, joy, to share. Thank you so much, because it must be hard to talk about those experiences. Joy, when you started very early on, I wrote down um, as part of my response, how brave I thought your mother was. And that was right at the beginning. And when you were talking to her about your father's death the first time, and just as the story went on, it mounted. And I just really just want to say sorry to you on behalf of this country that they had to go through that. I think it's awful. Uh, and um, uh, I'm very pleased to be able to be here as part of this campaign. I always joke that I'm only actually half in favour of dignity in dying. I'm greatly in favour of dignity. I'm not so sure about dying. Um, but the um, if we are going to have to die, and we all have to, let's make sure that we allow ourselves and uh, and and others to, to die in dignity. And uh, we've talked about coronavirus and the impact it's had, uh, and we've had a big debate about death. But as an economist, I suppose we've had a lot of conversation about macro death and not much about micro death. In other words, we've talked about the uh, the politics uh, and uh, moral choices around very large population uh, deaths and the extent, the the uh, degree of trouble we've gone to over that particular issue has is been incredibly impressive, and it certainly gives the lie to to people who suggest that we're atomized individuals that we don't cooperate with each other. But um, we haven't given much thought to micro death, to the individual experience of people dying, and uh, what we can do to make that. Um, you know, a better experience uh, for our relatives and for ourselves. Um, <clears throat> this um, campaign fits very strongly with my broad politics, and it's one of the reasons why I, I, I just know it fits with it. Uh, because the first thing is, uh, the status quo doesn't work. My first um, inclination is always to say, well, why do we need to make a change at all? Um, but you listen to these stories. Um, and, uh, you know, very early on, you talked about, uh, Joy, you talked about your mum, uh, and the possibility of, uh, and, and yourself, um, searching online about Dignitas and how that might cause legal trouble later. A big moment for me was hearing Ian Blair in the House of Lords talk about what the police do, and I've later had experience and written about what the police do when um, 
your, your, your relatives die and uh, they suspect that you might be involved. And it shows that the model which suggests we have a set of rules, the prosecutor can decide whether to follow that set of rules, that doesn't work because the amount of uh, misery uh, uh, it, it visits on people even before they get to the appalling position that your mum got into, uh, Joy, that, that, um, that is a very widespread um, experience and it doesn't work. So the first step in any change is um, can parliamentarians afford to just say, well, We've got a system that roughly works. We can muddle through. The status quo will be all right. There are lots of other priorities. The answer to that is no, it doesn't work. It's bringing individual suffering to unnecessarily to lots of people quite sharply, and not only uh, to individuals, but more broadly. Um, so that's the first step in any argument. The second is the uh, change that's required, something that fundamentally uh, shakes society and um, we can't be sure really works. Um, or is it a modest, workable, concrete change which you can bring about through definable rules and has limited but importantly uh, positive effects? That's always the next test that I apply to any particular idea. Uh, and the answer is absolutely clearly. That's why, uh, Jill, it's so important to have you on the call. Fiona uh, Patton, thank you very much also for attending. This is a practical matter. Um, you know, my, my friend Andrew Mitchell um, is, a, is a practical executive politician, somebody who does things, um, and he wouldn't support this cause unless he could see that it was concrete, real, um, we can take small steps, first perhaps moving towards an inquiry, later towards legislation. This is not a pie in the sky uh, piece of, of, of overturning the furniture for its own sake. So that's the second uh, point. The third is, and this is very important for me as a conservative, um, uh, the, the, the big uh, battle for me always is to decide whether something is a temporary uh, whim of opinion or a, or a fundamental uh, view, a settled view of society. And I saw a Gallup poll from 1937. It was only the second question that Gallup ever asked in Britain. And there was an overwhelming majority uh, in favour of um, assisted dying. It was over 60% at that point, and it's now over 80%. And this illustrates it is a settled view. One of the reasons why I think we've had a little bit of difficulty winning the parliamentary majorities that we need is that parliamentarians get their post bag and they think this is a very split issue, which is roughly equal. It's not roughly equal. It's roughly equal in letter writing, much for the reasons that Jill suggested, right? Um, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're uh, to, to try to uh, write... Um, uh, to, to try to launch campaigns when you're terminally ill or after you've died is um, not actually these are suboptimal moments for lobbying your member of parliament and so people get the impression of that there is a split in the country that actually isn't it's a settled and long-standing view and it goes with the grain also of things the prime minister has himself said in parliament and i think therefore we can uh, proceed knowing that it is a bipartisan, a widely held, concrete and modest uh, reform. Uh, and But finally, that doesn't rob it of being a landmark change. It, this is big enough to be worthy of our time. It runs alongside the very big changes that have been made in society that we now look back and say, would never change that the, the legalization of homosexuality or the vote or votes for women. Uh, these are points that Sarah makes brilliantly in in the book, and um, this this is uh, one of those rare occasions politicians get to pass something concrete with widespread public support, uh, with the support of the uh, of, of of you know of people over a very long period of time that does something concrete and firm, um, but yet is big and landmark, something that people can do in their uh, political life and look back and say, well, I voted for that, I did that, and that um, at the end of a political life is a very important thing to be able to say. We, we could, of course, let this uh, go. You can leave this to the next uh, generation of uh, politicians, but there's no reason to do that because we can do it now. I really think the majority for this is assemblable. So anyway, uh, that uh, is why I'm behind this cause, why I hope everybody on this call is behind this cause and why it was my privilege to say thank you to the speakers that came before me. 
Indeed. Uh, Danny, thank you so much. And you're absolutely right. I, I, I totally agree. I think it is assemblable um, and it, it's an, a real honour for those of you watching and listening uh, to be able to be part of that. And that's very much um, my, my, my own view. And I know Andrew and, and many others. Um, we've got a, a short time left. I'm very grateful for all those fantastic contributions. Thank you so much. Um, we've got a short time for some uh, questions or comments briefly from some of my colleagues. If Avera Hobhouse, um, Is the this is this is where my this is where my remote chairing comes in, Vera. If you can unmute, thank you. Yep. All right. Okay. I, um, so thank you everybody for for your contributions. And I I have to say I'm I'm typically somebody who was probably open minded but not entirely uh, uh, convinced. Um, but I have to give credit to um, a very strong campaigning group in Bath who keeps engaging with me, and I think that's very important. So. Um, I just wanted to, to understand, because I, I, I think the, the um, example from Australia is absolutely fascinating, that one needs to build consensus in the forefront before the legislation comes uh, on, the, on the table, because it will always be, uh, it will always be, hang on, I actually see, uh, it will always be um, also a, um, uh, you know, a conscience vote, so you always have a free vote on it, so we need to make sure that the vote can be won. So um, how far have we gone in Britain about the process that has been described as it happened in Australia? Um, that would interest me. So how far have we got with that? Okay, thank you, Vera. I'm going to, because we've only got 10 minutes, and I'm happy to come back to, but we certainly, there's a lot of um, work in Parliament and, and, and some uh, recent debates and conversations and groups like this uh, to talk with. And, and I know from, you're, you're a neighbour of mine in Bath, um, Bristol, from the Liberal Democrat Party, um, and engaging as you've done with local groups is really positive and, and to keep having those discussions. Um, Simon Baines. Is Simon still there? Simon, if you can unmute and you had a comment to make. Right, um, thank, thank you very much indeed. Um, I, I've been very moved like everybody else by the contributions today. And um, both my parents died of cancer and um, in, there was a um, difficult end of life. And also my mother-in-law had Alzheimer's for many years so it's a subject that has um, particularly preoccupied us as a family. My, my concern is really about um, the, the misuse of this right and in particular um, when we used to go and visit my mother-in-law in her care home, um, she had Alzheimer's for about six to eight years, um, we discovered that she was, many of the other people in the care home, their families virtually never visited them and I think that the element in this, which does need further exploration, is, the, is how much it's open to abuse. And we've heard from many people who care very much for their parents. But what I found rather shocking um, in visiting my mother-in-law was the degree to which many people are almost abandoned by their families when they have um, Alzheimer's or dementia over a long period of time. And that's the bit that concerns me, um, whether, you know, we're, we're assuming that everybody um, has the same um, love and uh, affection for their families, which I'm not entirely sure is the case. Simon, Simon thank you. Thank I, will you. Come I will come back. back. Um, um, Simon, uh, Simon, thank you, thank for, you sharing for sharing both, both your, your experience, experience and, and your genuine, genuine questions. questions. Um, um, we'll come we'll back, come in, back a in a minute. I just, I just want to take the last, last two, two. And I'm sorry I'm about that. Anne McLaughlin. Anne McLaughlin. Hi there. Hi, Anne. Hi. Um, I just uh, really wanted to thank everybody. I, I was one of a minority of members of the Scottish Parliament about 10 years ago who voted in favour of changing the law. Uh, as I say, I was part of a minority then and at the moment I, I still am. But um, I, I kind of um, I th came to this meeting because so many of my constituents asked me to come. I knew what my views were and I didn't think they would shift, but actually having listened to Cher's story and having listened to Jill's story, um, 
my joy story, sorry, my, my views have shifted, they've strengthened. And I really thank you for that. And I also want to apologize to Joy for what happened. That is an absolutely horrendous story. Your mother should never have had to have gone through that and neither uh, should you and the rest of your family. And I'm really sorry that you did have to, but one little ray of hope is this, that, that and I think the other two politicians have, have alluded to this, that things that you previously thought were impossible COVID-19 has shown us that they can be possible. Whoever would have thought that a government would be paying 80% of millions of people's wages, whoever thought a conservative government would be doing something like that. Things like universal basic income, when you talked about that two years ago, you were laughed at. Now it's being taken seriously, not supported by everybody, but by being taken seriously. So I would just say, please just have a little bit of um, hope and faith that things can change in a heartbeat and just keep pushing and i'll be very happy to help with that and and i'm very well, grateful my, my camera's thank covered you. up and i don't know why so sorry That's about okay. that no thank you very much and again for sharing your honest reflections we're finding and vera to partly answer your question it's it's events like this we're trying to do as an all-party group we're very grateful for people who are sharing traumatic experiences um, and experts from around the world have come to talk to us and and, and that's how we want to uh, help people understand I'm going to come to Jill in a moment but I'm just going to take um, Munira Wilson um, and then Jill if you could answer some of the questions about the concern uh, about doing no harm uh, that Simon raised thank you Munira yeah, hi, thank you, and, and thank you as well from me to the speakers. Oh, we, we were doing well. If you perhaps try the video, but unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, I can now. Sorry, I was just saying uh, thank you very much to the speakers, but um, I was instinctively against uh, assisted dying. I'm one of those who I would say is now very much more in the open-minded category, leaning towards pro, but I... I, I have a lot of the traditional concerns that Jill referred to. So I know we don't have much time, but I would uh, appreciate a, a, a bit of a synopsis about how you tackled some of those issues around safeguarding exploitation and using it as rationing of, of healthcare resources. But also I'm, I'm keen to know what the numbers have been in the last 12 months since you passed the legislation in terms of people, um, uh, I can't think what the phrase is, taking advantage of or using this, this legislation. Uh, to, to have a dignified death. Thank you. Thank you, Manira. Jill, could you answer some of those questions for us yes. as a legislator? That would be really helpful. Absolutely. Uh, the Victorian model um, has a number of legislative requirements around when people can make an application for um, what's called an assisted dying um, permit. And in order to be eligible under the Victorian scheme, you've got to be assessed by two doctors um, one of whom has expertise in what the cause of your terminal illness is. Um, and as part of that assessment, um, assessments have to be made, and this is actually set out in the statute um, that um, legalised assisted dying in Victoria. Assessments have to be made around any indications of um, exploitation or elder abuse, um, any manifestations of um, any form of mental illness that might be um, um, contributing to a person's um, request. Um, in Australia, um, our doctors are all regulated by um, particular codes of conduct, but we have also got a requirement in Australia that any doctor who is making an assessment around assisted dying has to have done um, specific training around identifying issues of elder abuse, exploitation, making a decision around the capacity. Um, they've got to testify, they've got to attest um, and do an assessment around a person's um, ability to make decisions um, on their own behalf. And that, that ultimately became a little bit controversial because excluded from the Australian model um, is um, Alzheimer's and um, other illnesses where a person may not have capacity uh, to make the request and they're not things that you can request in an advanced care directive under the law in Australia and that was a great disappointment to many of um, the activists and advocates from organisations like Alzheimer's Australia but ultimately a model where a person has capacity in the here and now is assessed by two doctors as having that capacity um, who have to make 
an attestation um, and if they were, for example, you know, anyone kind of doing the wrong thing on that front um, would lose their medical practicing certificate. They have to be specifically trained in the legal requirements of assisted dying. Um, and that is overseen, what, overseen by what's called the Assisted Dying Review Board. So all of that material is reviewed in real time. Um, we also had to make that pragmatic, recognising that um, someone who is dying, it can't be done all, you know, in the, it, you can't kind of do it in 24 hours. Um, and so uh, there are kind of time regulation around those issues. But of course, people that are dying, we need to balance that back off. In terms Jill. of the numbers, in terms of the numbers, 100 applicants um, in about a year and about 52. And we knew from our experience that for people, it wasn't necessarily, it was, it was the comfort of knowing it was there as a choice. Mm -hmm. That has been what's been really important. But around 52 in 12 months, people have actually used assisted dying is um, what the assisted dying review board has reported in its annual report. Jill, that's really helpful. Thank you. And for, so that other colleagues, my parliamentary colleagues here are, are very clear. The APPG is very clear that um, we're seeking reform and it is a modest reform um, of uh, people who've got mental capacity and with a diagnosis of six months of terminal illness. Um, and um, the experience is across the world that it is that comfort, as Jill says, that actually very few people um, utilise the option. Uh, it's the comfort of knowing. Um, and, and that's what we're seeking to do with events like this. Um, we've had uh, clinical experts from around the world, as well as legislators, as well as um, the stories from families such as Joy and Cher. Um, and indeed, at our last APPG, we had the police um, talk to us about how they're having to enact the law and previously in parliament we also welcomed Jeff and Anne Whaley and Jeff Whaley was so passionate about saying how hard it was um, to actually get to Dignitas and to prove that he was of sound mind uh, and, and, and ability. So I, I am assured of, of, of those things as a parliamentarian, but I know it's really important that other colleagues are. Um, I think we've, we've come to the end of our, our time. Um, I really want to thank Joy um, if you wanted to just say another quick word, if you wanted to add anything. I just want to say thank you um, from all of us, from myself, from my family, because I am literally overwhelmed with the response that we've had uh, today. So just thank you from the bottom of our hearts and hopefully we can put a little bit of dent and move forward. Thank you, Joy, thank you. and best wishes to you and your family and, and you. share. Same and Joy. I, uh, I honor you and your family. I wish so much that you all could have had what my parents were afforded and 20 years of ex more than 20 years of experience in Oregon. And it is clear this is compassionate and it is not abused. So I'm so grateful to those of you who are considering it and staying open-minded. And I pray that your laws will be changed soon. Cher, thank you for your experience and your inspiration. Thank you, Jill, for joining us, Danny and Sarah for your contributions and for Dignity and Dine for organising this session this morning. And thank you, everyone, for uh, listening and following us on YouTube. Thank you. <laughs>